Hey everyone, welcome to the exhibitor track. I'm Hitesh Bambani, a volunteer on the OASP community. I'll be moderating this session. During the next 45 minutes, you'll be listening to Elam and more. They're presenting benchmarking the security of your software supply chain. Please submit any questions you have during the session in the Q&A tab that's just to the right of this video in the Hula platform. I'll be asking them your questions in the last 10 minutes of the session. Also note that the chat function in Zoom is disabled for attendees, but you can still leave comments and chat in the Hua platform. Okay, so let's um, let's talk about the speakers. Elam is co-founder and CTO of Argon Security, which is now part of Aqua Company. Argon enables DevOps and security teams to protect their software delivery pipelines against supply chain attacks. Uh, you see a lot of those misconfigurations and vulnerabilities. Before founding Argon, Elam served in the, as a security team lead in the Israeli military for seven years as I'm the founder and consultant of various startups. Joining him is Moore, who is a senior software engineer at Argon. Um, he has more has vast experiences analyzing threats, targeting cloud native environments and developing solutions against those threats. He loves swimming and traveling with his wonderful wife and kids. So gentlemen, please go ahead and uh, share his slide deck. Okay, great. Thanks for the introduction. Amazing. So as Itash said, we'll be speaking about benchmarking your software supply chain. Um, just a very quick introduction of us. Uh, so my name is Elam. I'm the CTO and co-founder of Argon. Uh, as part of my day-to-day -day job, I get to speak with a lot of DevOps and security teams uh, really on amazing topics. So hopefully I can share some of those insights today with you and more. Hi everyone, I'm uh, Mo Weinberger, a father of uh, two awesome kids, and I've uh, joined Argon as a senior software engineer seven months ago. Uh, prior Argon, I worked for uh, Microsoft for uh, four and a half years around cloud security threats products and have uh, quite experience in uh, cloud native threats. And actually, I'm really excited to be here. Great. So, just a quick word about Argon. Um, so Argon was a company that uh, founded on the, on the basis of helping other companies secure in the software supply chain. Uh, we have recently became part of Aqua, Aqua Security, which does a lot of awesome work around security as well. Um, and together, the mission is really to help all companies uh, to stop cloud native attacks. Our focus today is specifically the software supply chain. So that's what we'll cover. Um, just to give you a heads up on, on the agenda. So we don't have a lot of time, but these are the things that we'll cover. Uh, the intro of us is done. Um, next, I'll give us just a brief overview of the software supply chain. So I know this is a technical crowd here, but uh, still I think there's a lot of confusion around the topic. So I'll give us like a zero to hero kind of an overview. Um, then we'll talk about some attacks, which is the more interesting part. Uh, we'll dive deep into some of them. Um, and finally, uh, Mor is going to share with us a live demo of a project that will be revealed here for the first time. So this should be exciting and that's it for today. So about the software supply chain, um, I know this is a term that is already thrown out there a lot, uh, but I do see a lot of confusion about what is the definition of it. Uh, so we try to kind of clearly define it here. Um, so anything that is in your source code or affects it in any way uh, from the moment of development uh, throughout the build pipeline, the packaging, and up until the time it is ready to be deployed to production. So commit to deploy, as we see here from left to right, uh, this is the time frame that we often refer to as the software supply chain. And we can see here it's, comp it's uh, composed of uh, essentially five different uh, layers. So the first one would be the source code where you uh, work with your team on the code base, uh, contributing to it. Uh, the second part is the dependencies of the code, uh, known as material as well. Um, anything you bring into uh, to be part of your development process, the build where uh, CI pipelines take your source code, compile it into uh, something that is runnable, so an artifact. Uh, this is the fourth phase, so managing those artifacts, those different versions of your microservices. 
Um, and write up and until the time you're ready to deploy them uh, to whichever environment you want. So your development environment, your production environment. Um, so these are kind of the different layers of the software supply chain. And this is uh, the time frame where it exists. And the thing about it is that uh, today we can see kind of uh, a simple example uh, of, a, of, a, of a software supply chain uh, process. Um, and I guess even the more simplest examples are still kind of uh, very hectic and very complex. Um, and it didn't really used to look like that. Um, so in the past few years, uh, in a relatively short time span, we saw a dramatic shift in technology in the way this process is composed. Uh, so companies don't really software today as they used to just two, three, five years ago. Uh, so a very short time span uh, for a very rapid change in the process. Um, so just to kind of demonstrate how rapid this change was, uh, I tried to touch here on some interesting points on the timeline. Uh, so we can see here that uh, GitLab, uh, the DevOps giant, uh, one of the big four, which we all know today, um, just in 2015, not so long ago, was a 10 people operation, uh, which is insane to think about. Um, right after that, Google, Google Cloud, get, got into the building software aspect. Uh, with only a beta release of its build service. Um, after that, in 2000, 2017, um, Bitbucket Pipeline was introduced to replace uh, the, the older Bamboo um, and Azure DevOps Cloud, which is now one of the more popular platforms uh, for software companies out there. Um, it's only officially launched under the name Azure DevOps uh, in 2018. And GitHub, of course, one of the bigger players in the market, um, has actually only introduced its action, its CI platform um, in 2019 uh, when it became GA. Um, and this is insane to think about because today it's the third most popular CI platform out there. Uh, and it only exists a couple of years. Um, container registry was also in introduced last year. Um, so you see kind of how things we take for granted today uh, while we develop, um, and I'm referring to the community of engineering of developers of DevOps, um, are not so uh, not so veteran in the market. They are relatively fresh, um, and the processes that were created around them uh, are definitely fresh as well. And that this is why it's a challenge uh, to make sense of it and definitely to secure it. So just kind of a, like a general overview of how uh, security personnel see this uh, this market. So I will not go over uh, the numbers here, and you shouldn't either. Uh, I'll give you the highlight. Uh, so we conducted a survey around the software supply chain security topic. Uh, we questioned over 200 CISOs globally, so all over the world. Um, and we asked them, well, question about how they feel about security of the software supply chain, uh, which endeavors do they take on securing it? Um, and I won't touch on, the, on all the points, but just like two major factors that I took um, as very interesting was one, uh, the majority of companies actually use over three different platforms, uh, DevOps platforms to build their software. Um, and every platform is like a, a small universe on its own. Uh, so going across at least three of them is definitely part of what makes this process so hard to manage. Um, the second point, which I find to be the most interesting um, is we ask them one question, those security personnel, those security experts, we ask them, what is the number one uh, difficulty in securing your software supply chain today? And the number one result that we got uh, was collaboration between DevOps and security teams. Um, and it's an, an incredible thing to think about because the number one challenge uh, is not about code, not about technology, not about uh, any other tool out there. It's about people, it's about processes. So I think this kind of well reflects like the, the issue of software release. Okay, so now hopefully that we got a, a, a little clearer about the software supply chain and its different aspect. Uh, so let's talk about recent events, uh, including attacking uh, the software supply chain. Amazing. So we see here um, some four uh, of the bigger, more known events. Um, these are kind of events that paved the way into public knowledge of how important it is to secure a software supply chain. So I won't deep dive into the four of them. I'll just give us a quick overview and then we'll dive later on. Um, 
So the number one on the left, on the top left we see is the case of Mercedes-Benz, uh, where 600, roughly 600 code repositories, private code repositories, were leaked online through their GitLab server, their instance, their private instance, uh, on-premise instance of GitLab server, uh, due to failure in configuration uh, of the set of tools used them. Uh, so a hacker was able to leak them out online. Um, the one just below it um, is the case known as CI poisoning um, of a company named Kodkov uh, that an attacker was able to gain access directly into the CI environments of uh, software companies. So where they build their software, uh, this is a more sensitive area. Um, and we'll talk about this one specifically in depth right after this. Um, the one uh, on the right, um, dependency confusion is one of the more uh, familiar topics. Um, it, it has its own buzzword, so dependency confusion. Uh, the idea is that attack, <clears throat> sorry, attackers were, were able to demonstrate just how easy it is uh, to confuse your package manager, uh, your registry services, uh, into pulling external packages, external code packages into your private environment instead of the one that you meant to pull that are private to you, um, essentially running someone else's code on your private premise very easily. And I think like the fourth one um, doesn't really need any introduction. So solar wind um, in a sentence, a, a code time, a build time code injection um, where attackers uh, gained access to the build environment of the Orion app, uh, were able to inject code into the app, affecting uh, tens of thousands of customers worldwide. And maybe some more recent attack, more? Yeah, so regarding the more recent uh, trends, we all heard about a uh, log4j vulnerability that affects basically every organization that uh, depends on software which are written in Java. But we also started seeing in the last year that even the maintainers of popular uh, open source project that we all use put us uh, the, the consumer at risk. So here are just a few examples. Color.js and Faker.js are quite popular packages with uh, more than 21 million uh, weekly downloads. And suddenly the maintainers add a malicious code that runs uh, in an infinity uh, loop, which basically breaks the system that uh, runs it. Uh, later on, he published a message that uh, described the reason behind it. He basically was upset that the commercial uh, product extensively rely on his uh, contribution without give back. Or uh, how he said in his own words, he provide a free work. Uh, Node APC is another example of what is now called protestware, which is a marriage of two terms, protest and software, where the maintainers adds code that checks if the machine that use it uh, came from a Russian or a Belarusian uh, IP address. And uh, if so, it basically wiped the hard disk. And uh, as you guessed, this was a political protest of the maintainer that uh, aimed to support the uh, Ukraine efforts in the ongoing uh, war. So we are really seeing here that the attacker personas and the intention are changing uh, from what we used to uh, in the past. Great. So finally, let's dive into a few attacks. Uh, the idea is to better understand the concept of securing your supply chain uh, with looking at some of the um, more sophisticated attacks. So this one is actually kind of nice because it's not one of the most heard of, um, but it's definitely a widespread one and an important one to, to understand because it, uh, the concept of it uh, is definitely something any DevOps team should, uh, should be aware of. Uh, so this is the case of a GitHub action. Um, its name was is check spelling action. Um, and we can see here uh, the security advisory message uh, that actually started uh, the, whole, uh, the whole topic. Uh, we can see it's about a, a leakage of a GitHub access token. So looking at those lines, what we see here um, is the way uh, engineering teams use this action. Uh, so a GitHub action is a small piece of code um, and the check spelling one, well, it check spells your code um, to every pull request submitted to your code repository. Um, the check spelling action would check it and verify that you don't have any uh, spelling errors. And this is actually the concept of actions, right? So the idea is you take someone else's code, wrap it in an action, um, it's open source, and then you use it in your CI pipeline. 
Um, and it's easy to install them just as it, as it is easy to install applications from the marketplace. So we see here GitHub's marketplace for actions um, where you can, you can download and use the check spelling action. Um, and the thing is that it's no longer just the application that has the dependency, right? Um, if it used to be uh, my node module uh, folder, which contains my application dependency, now my CI pipeline itself also contains dependencies. So my pipeline dependency, um, and if you recall the definition of the software supply chain, so anything affecting my source code from the moment of commit up until the moment of deploy, uh, well, those pipeline dependencies definitely do affect my source code. So let's see what happened there. Um, so a check spelling action, as we said, um, and the problem was with its workflow. So workflow is GitHub's CI, um, and it's a YAML file with a set of instructions on what to do on my source code. Now we can see the screenshot from the documentation. Uh, just copy the uh, spell check uh, .github directory into your project, and then you would enjoy the workflow. Um, unfortunately, this workflow was very improperly configured. So it's, it opened up any um, code uh, repository into the attack. Uh, essentially, it allowed the attackers to gain write access to the repository. So again, write access to your code repository means someone else that you didn't grant access can write code to your private project. So how exactly did this happen? Uh, so we can see here the impact definition of the event. Um, so the repository check spelling action enabled the trigger. The trigger name was on pull request target. So some of you might be familiar with the name, some of you uh, might not be. Um, the pull request target event is the name of an event that GitHub lets you choose um, as the triggering event of your pipeline, of your workflow. Um, now it is annoyingly similar to the other trigger pull request uh, without the target. Um, but the idea is that the pull request target event uh, is the trigger that was actually allowing the attacker um, to send a pull request against your repository uh, and easily uh, extract your GitHub access token, uh, which has write access, as we'll see in a second, um, and with it, just make an easy API call to change your source code. So this is the example of the workflow. This is how it looks like. Uh, so we can see on the top of the screen, we can see the pull request target. This is the event. Um, and the danger, the danger thing to do is to combine the pull request target uh, event together with the checkout of the specific pull request. Now, the reason this is dangerous um, is because GitHub CI runners, uh, those uh, small utils that take your source code and build it, um, they let this pull request run in the context of your private environment because you're using the pull request target event and you're checking out the same pull request anything written in the workflow of this pull request would be run on your private environment. This means the context uh, it will be used um, is with your own GitHub access token. Each one of those runners it is issued a GitHub access token. Um, and if I gain access to it, then I can do whatever I want with the source code. So some workarounds to that. Uh, so obviously a workaround would be to disable the workflow. Uh, I guess this is not really solving the problem, but rather ignoring it. Um, and then we had this instruction to allow actions only created by GitHub. Uh, so this got me thinking, um, what's, the, what's the default level of, of allowance that we have, right? Because if this is the recommendation, then uh, what happens when I create a new repository from scratch? So that's what I did. I created a new project. Um, and you can see here that the workflow, my project CI, um, actually has read and write permission. Uh, this means when you can see in the subtitle, the GitHub access token that allows my CI runners to do actions on my source code um, is by default granted read and write access. Um, and you can obviously go here and check for yourself, um, but not only that, the actions themselves that I choose to install um, are also by allowance, um, are just kind of very including. So all of them, uh, anyone that releases an action to GitHub's marketplace, um, can I, I can actually install it and run it as part of my CI, as opposed to only one verified by GitHub, for example, or only one verified by my organization. So the solution of that would actually be to just upgrade to uh, the later version, uh, which already did not include the, the misconfigured workflow. Um, however, there's a catch. 
So the idea is that if you're an open source maintainer and you have a public repository with the check spelling action, uh, then it's not enough to update the check spelling action on your main branch. Uh, you would have to go throughout all your branches, throughout all the history, uh, and make sure that none of them contain a copy of the misconfigured workflow because an attacker can open up a pull request against one of those branches um, and gain the same level of access to your repository. So a solution with a catch, uh, not a fun situation to be in. Great, so anatomy of an attack number two, um, and then we'll hand it over to you, Mo. So another action to continue the sequence, but on a, on a whole other angle of attack, um, would be the instance of code call. So we mentioned it briefly very earlier. Uh, we can see here the lines which I would use as, as a, a developer, as a DevOps engineer, um, to upload my test coverage to CodeCov's platform. So what happened there? Um, so CodeCov is a very popular uh, test coverage solution. Um, you can see here uh, how it looks like. Um, you use it as part of your CI mostly. Uh, you can either, either use the GitHub action wrapping it, or you can just uh, di directly download um, the code of uh, automation script. And it was hacked. It was hacked pretty bad. Um, and essentially, it affected all CI pipelines using it. So what exactly happened there? Um, so an integer was able to modify one of code code's automation script, so changing the source code of it. Um, the reason for it is unknown. It has yet to be publicly exposed, um, but it has come to, the, to our attention that it was due to uh, gaining access to CodeCov's private Google Cloud storage um, with an access token. Um, the access token was leaked through a build process of a container image. Uh, now, this is a topic all on its own, but uh, what I've learned from researching the topic um, is that it, it is an extremely easy, easy thing to do, to leak sensitive data when you're building Docker containers. Uh, as an engineer, I was surprised. To, I was very surprised to learn how easy it was. Um, you can see here, even the Docker history command uh, might be revealing for you. Um, so gaining the access token allowed the attacker to change the source code. Uh, this is how the code itself looked like. It's a small utility, uh, nothing special. And this is the single line of code that was added by the attacker. Um, so. Those of you who might be coders uh, would definitely be able to figure out what it does. It's a very simple line. Um, so it prints out the environment variable, uh, which I currently have access to, and sends them out back home to a remote server. Um, and since this is something running as part of my CI environment, uh, then by definition, uh, I have a lot of sensitive uh, environment variables there. Um, so essentially, I've exposed uh, access tokens, user credentials, API keys, whatnot, uh, right to the attacker's server. Now, the results of the hack was were uh, pretty massive. So um, we can see some uh, some companies here, large companies, who publicly acknowledge they were indeed affected by the hack. Um, but not only private companies. So open source project, uh, a lot of them uh, relied on Kotkov. Uh, some of them very popular. So we can see here Argo CD, Kubernetes, Ansible, Webpack. Um, those were all projects using CodeCo uh, as part of the CI and potentially uh, with a sensitive data leaked right out of it. In the time of the attack, if you, you would have gone to GitHub um, and search for the lines, uh, then you would see roughly around 400,000 results across code bases, across files. Uh, which just goes to show how popular the usage of it was. Okay, and now Mo would take us to anatomy of the third attack. Amazing. Just a second, I will take the control. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes. Amazing. So uh, Ilan just showed us an interesting technique that attackers use to bridge the software supply chain. But one might think that only a sophisticated or a nation state attacker are able to perform software supply chain attacks. And this is really not the case here. In the last year, we saw an increase in cases of uh, bad actors that has a great passion for crypto mining uh, by abusing CI CD compute power. 
Um, so what they do, they basically focus on finding vulnerable uh, platforms, like the, in the case Elam shows, or they basically look for the free tier of those platforms, like uh, GitHub Action or GitLab. So let's see how it actually looks like when uh, your platform being abused. Um, so here we can see a GitHub action statistic history uh, that shows an attacker that run uh, multiple, uh, multiple build steps in parallel uh, within uh, just a single plan. Each job here runs for six hours, which is the maximum uh, runtime allowed. And a closer look at the pipeline uh, declaration revealed the actual instructions behind it. So what we could see here, uh, we could see here a few optimization settings like uh, limit the parallelism uh, up to the tier limit and ignoring uh, fails. So one job will not affect uh, the other. Um, the interesting part here um, is the attacker chooses to run his mining process on a Windows image, but with WSL bash, which is basically the Windows subsystem for Linux. So that he could run uh, his bash scripts and the ELF binaries. Um, which at first glance, it looked a bit weird, right? Uh, as you can just run his uh, workload on a Linux image. But the actual intent of, uh, of this uh, actor is to create another sandboxing uh, layer in case there is some uh, auditing of the system activity. Uh, you, you just want to add uh, an evasion layer from uh, malware scanners. Um, lastly, we can see that attacker store is a miner under a Git IO domain. And this is another evasion layer that attackers add in order to keep uh, his mining activity um, under the radar in case of uh, network uh, auditing. Um, but you can argue, what are the actual risks when attacker abuse my CI CD as a mining farm, right? He doesn't really steal or uh, wipe my uh, stack, right? Um, so there are um, three major risks here. Uh, first is the financial uh, financial uh, loss. Either you run uh, on a SaaS platform or a self-hosted, you pay for the compute power. Um, it, it could be a runtime token in case of uh, SaaS or a monthly rent for a self-hosted. Um, the second risk here is denial of service. Uh, all of runners are busy with uh, crypto mining, right? Uh, and uh, as you saw, miners drain your uh, compute power up to the limit. And uh, this definitely would lead to denial of service of your uh, software uh, development uh, lifecycle. Um, and the third one is the most uh, important in, in terms of uh, risk. And once the attacker has foothold in your uh, CI CD, he can leak your code or even worse, steal your secret um, that could lead to compromise of your entire uh, cloud environment. Uh, here's an open source catalog of every known supply chain uh, compromises. So we can really see here that supply chain uh, attacks are just evolving and uh, starting to happen uh, really often. Um, so uh, what we can do? Uh, so as you see, there are multiple areas and risk when uh, we look on the, the software supply chain landscape. So one can try to audit and mitigate it a specific risk like scanning your uh, artifactory images or scanning your dependencies for vulnerabilities in your uh, source code or even try to restrict your uh, user permissions, which is extre extremely important. But as you saw, the blanket is too short in this case. It will not provide a really end-to-end -end visibility of your uh, security posture. There are uh, too many multiple areas with uh, multiple uh, risks. Um, and as you know, an attacker just need uh, to find the weak link of the change to enter your uh, software supply chain. Um, so again, what we could do about it? Um, so this is why we're partnering uh, right now with uh, CIS to create a new benchmark that looks on every risk from code to deploy. Um, and about CIS, CIS is actually a global uh, community of cybersecurity experts, uh, which developed benchmark for more than 100 configuration guidelines across uh, different vendors. And those are greatly adopted by uh, organization as part of the IT auditing process. Um, so we actually took Argon deep knowledge in software supply chain risk and experience and partnered with the CIS community uh, to create a new benchmark. Um, so this be benchmark have more than uh, 100 uh, guide guidance and best practices and are split into uh, different control and the sub control which provide practical down to earth guidance on uh, uh, every single risk that allows you to, to tackle down every risk and separate, uh, but also provide you overall security uh, posture of your software supply chain. Um, 
So the actual uh, CIS benchmark uh, is going to be released in two weeks. First is a white paper. So I invite you all to look and uh, provide your feedback and uh, contribution. Um, but in meantime, we can have a peek uh, of it in uh, Aqua AVD, which is a uh, stand for Aqua Vulnerability Database. Uh, it contains uh, vulnerabilities, misconfiguration, and also a uh, compliance. So uh, let's have a look. Um, so can you see my uh, screen, right? All right, so this is totally free and uh, open source and it's always uh, keeping up to date. Uh, we can find here um, database of uh, the latest uh, vulnerabilities, right? This is just uh, one example. We can also find here a cloud IAC misconfiguration of all the known uh, cloud platform. And there are also a compliance category. Uh, this is where we add a new uh, a CIS for a software supply chain. Uh, it's crucial to mention that we finished adding just 20% of uh, the entire control. So you can see here right now uh, only partial list. Um, so here's the, the first version. So we actually have five categories, source code, build, dependency, artifacts, and deployments. And every one of them um, contain the sub-control. So quick, quickly review some of those. Um, so, source code is all around uh, managing your source code. Uh, contribution access, for example, is where you verify the members uh, access aspect. Um, this one, for example, ensure all members enforce uh, um, MFA, multi-factor authentication. Even it, if it seems basic, we keep seeing uh, it happen all the time. Organization and members are not applying multi-factor authentication, which puts uh, their identities and their organization at risk. Um, another one is um, strict, uh, uh, strict uh, minimal base permission, as happened with uh, Mercedes. Um, case that allows free sign up for the GitLab server um, with uh, permissive base permission, which uh, end up uh, with source uh, code leakage. Uh, let's jump for another uh, category. Um, build one. Uh, so here we have two different sub control uh, build instruction and pipeline uh, integrity. Um, so let's see. Let's see um, pipeline instruction, for example. Um, this one makes sure uh, you are uh, automatically scan your uh, 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 pipelines for uh, uh, vulnerabilities. Um, and, uh, and this one ensure that you put, your, uh, uh, you put in place uh, sensitive uh, data scanners. So for example, secrets. This one will make sure no plain uh, text secrets will get into your uh, source code. And, um, another sub control is uh, pipeline integrity, which is a very hot topic these days. Um, we have here, uh, which is just a partial list, um, locked uh, dependencies, uh, which is very crucial to prevent the future risk of attacker that uh, compromise the dependencies and inject uh, malicious code, or it even put you at risk with a vulnerable uh, version, as happened with uh, spellcheck. Um, SBOM stands for a software bill of material, which is um, a very popular uh, topic these days. And it basically means that generating uh, SBOM will make sure to sign the artifacts when they were made and how they ma were made. Uh, this will allow you uh, to verify down the road before the deployment that uh, it didn't change since then. And we are uh, proof uh, that all the ingredients uh, are uh, verified. Um, last control that I will show you is around the artifactory, which basically focused on the uploaded assets from your uh, build system. Uh, package registry, um, um, we will cover here. Um, for example, this one control uh, is also responsible to make sure that private artifacts are not open to anonymous uh, access. Um, the risk is pretty obvious. Uh, as Elam shows with code of case, uh, that private uh, Docker image that was publicly accessed revealed the secret in the Docker history. It wouldn't happen if the assets wasn't allowed uh, anonymous access. 
Uh, okay, so we saw a few examples for those uh, controls and checks. Um, let's get back to the deck. Okay, do you see it full screen? Because I don't. Okay, so, so now what? So we said that the scope of this quiz is pretty wide and there is more than 100 guidance to assess on different control. So is it make sense to let the organization validate those checks by their own? Is it going to be yet another uh, long list of uh, supply chain guideline? Uh, so at Algon, we love to, to ask, how can we help uh, is the pain? Um, so I'm happy to share that we are working these days on a new open source project called Chainbench. Chainbench will automate uh, those checks and provide the first open source free to use CLI that scans your entire software supply chain stack and can show you end-to-end -end visibility to your uh, risk uh, pretty fast. Um, so before explaining further about Chainbench, let's start with the demo. Just a second, I will show my uh, another browser, just a second. Okay, I got it. Okay, so um, here we have a dummy repo that was forked from uh, Node Redis, which is Redis client implementation for Node.js, just as an example. Um, as you can see, this is public repo, but you can also try a chain bench on your uh, private repo as well. Um, we have here uh, 23 uh, members, and we also have here a few pipeline under the workflow. Let's just see one of them. So we have here uh, pipeline dependencies and a few steps, right. Um, so let's run the tool uh, on this uh, dummy repo and see which risks uh, are hidden inside. All right, so before uh, running Chainbench, we need to provide a, a repository URL and the access token for uh, retrieving the required info. If your uh, repo is public, some of those uh, info is already available for everyone, right? Um, so let's run it. So now we are retrieving the required information. It will take a few seconds. Meantime, yeah, you can enjoy uh, those nice emojis. Um, so the output is table format. Each row is a single check. Uh, the ID column is correlated with the CIS the identifications. And we also have uh, here the uh, title, result, and the reasons with additional information. So right now we have 36 checks that we have implemented recently. And we could uh, also um, use the JSON format of it um, with uh, more information such as uh, description, remediation, and the link to the AVD that I presented earlier. All right, um, so let's say we want to start uh, reviewing those results and mitigate it uh, one by one, right? So let's have a closer look uh, on a few of them and uh, let me clean the mess a little bit. All right, so right now I'm, I'm running the same uh, uh, command just with uh, filtering um, uh, arguments that uh, that make sure I will uh, see just a few of those checks. So on uh, this check, we can see there are 22 inactive users. That means 22 accounts that doesn't need to have access to this repository since they didn't make any change or contribution in the last three months. Um, this one tells us there are no enforcement enforcement for, a, to a, a, for a NFA. So in case of a token leakage, or even a county cover, which is way too easy without MFA, the attacker will have a foot at your software supply chain, um, where it could leak your source code, leverage secrets uh, that you might store in your source code. Um, 
which is exactly what this checks uh, looks for. It makes sure we are running a secret scanner. Um, we also have this one that complains that the base permission is too permissive. So every user has access to create new repo, change code, and run pipeline, which is what happens with the Mercedes case, which allows the attacker to register a new user in the uh, GitLab server and basically dump the, uh, all the private uh, source code uh, with just the base permission. And what about dependencies risk, right? Um, how do we protect against uh, rogue dependencies like uh, Elam shows uh, or even uh, vulnerable packages? So we have these checks uh, that make sure you run a vulnerability scanner in your pipeline. So no vulnerabilities packages gets in. All right, so let's see how we can fix some of them, some of those. Um, so let's get back to uh, the repository. Um, so uh, first of all, let's apply a multi a multi factor authentication uh, for all the uh, members uh, under the, this organization. Okay, so we are done. Um, and let's change the base permission from write to read. All right, we are good with that. And let's add a new pipeline that scans for a vulnerability um, packages. So we get into uh, the workflow, create new file, and add this content that I added here, just a second. Let's give him a file name. So basically what the, the, uh, this uh, declaration uh, means that on every push and pull request, um, we will run uh, the vulnerability scanner uh, trivia, which is uh, open source. Um, so let's uh, get this inside the master, All right? So actually push code to master is quite dangerous, right? Without uh, reviewers. Um, this is dangerous both for uh, breaking stuff and also as a security issue. So let's add uh, some um, branch protection settings um, on the main branch, which is master. Um, so here I required a uh, approval of, uh, of the pull request with at least uh, two members. All right, so uh, this will make sure uh, every new change will be verified by additional eyes. Um, all right, so I think we can run the tool uh, again. Okay, so as you see right away, our situation is much better. I would actually go and fix the rest of the risk if I had uh, enough time, but uh, let's move on back to the deck, I guess. All right. Um, so I think with such an automation tool, you can get a big picture without bothering on a specific risk area. You can start thinking of how you could take this to a, a new capability and leverage it uh, even greater. Um, so a bit more technical details about Chainbench. So Chainbench is written in Go, which allows running in performance while creating just one static binary that can support uh, multiple uh, environments. Uh, the tool is built in such a way that it's easy to have a uh, new support for new SCM, CI or Artifactory, you name it. Um, every new integration has a defined set of uh, instructions that it needs to implement before uh, integrated. So the checks are uh, agnostic to providers. That means one single checks for uh, all providers. And the actual checks were written in uh, Rego by Open Policy Agent, which is policy language that is uh, easy to read and uh, write, especially for uh, non-developers. Uh, we currently support GitHub as uh, SCM with uh, uh, 40 of the checks uh, coverage and counting. Um, the checks information list is uh, automatically reflected in the AVD, as you saw, uh, once the checks uh, are added into a uh, chain bench. 
uh, with uh, nightly jobs mean uh, no hassle to make it updated, just one uh, place to, to manage. To manage. Um, so what next? Um, so finally, we plan to release Chainbench as open source project in the next two weeks. Um, uh, so please follow us uh, to stay tuned. Uh, I invite you all to play with it, uh, assess your uh, software supply chain stack, make it more security. Uh, please provide feedback and contribution. This is crucial uh, for this project and to our community. Uh, and by the way, Ilam and I can discuss further and show you an on-site demo at the Austin Open Source Summit. Um, so let's wrap up, I guess. Great. So with the few minutes that we have, um, let's wrap up real quick. Um, this was extremely exciting to see. Uh, there's nothing like the feeling of seeing that red uh, warning becomes a green pest check. Um, and this is, I guess, this is the power of Chainbench. This is what we are trying to contribute to the community. Um, the idea that securing your software supply chain really doesn't have to be a hassle. Um, so if you click one more slide um, and we'll wrap up. Um, so closing with the way we started, the software supply chain, even though we often refer to it as a single process, it's actually composed of a few different layers. We can see them here. Um, so five layers uh, from your source code throughout until deployment time. Um, and it's equally important to secure each and every phase because a failure to do so, as we can see, you can click this line, um, a failure to secure your dependencies, for example, your materials uh, could result in an incident like the one we discussed uh, about code code. And a failure to secure your build pipeline, your build environment um, is essentially the case uh, of what happened with the solo wind attack. Um, and again, a failure to secure your artifacts, your package manager uh, could easily lead you down the path of being uh, part of a dependency confusion attack. Um, so securing those chains in the link um, is important to secure the entire, uh, the entire process itself. Um, we can see here the framework, which uh, everything starting from Chainbench uh, to other solutions is built around. Um, so commit to deploy with the different phases. And you can see one through eight is the set of controls uh, that are required to put in place in order to fully secure the supply chain. Uh, now, this is what Chainbench is based on. Uh, so Chainbench itself kind of takes away the, uh, the trouble of getting to know each and every uh, phase of the process um, and essentially makes it doable to protect your software supply chain, uh, which much, with much more ease uh, and automation. And hopefully, uh, if you can click one more, then it would prevent you from being anywhere near uh, one of the next software supply chain attacks. And I think that's it for today, right? That's the one last slide. So thank you everybody for the time. Uh, I guess we'll be taking some questions with the time that we have now. Yes, thank you, Elam and more. Um, also, congratulations on uh, releasing uh, the new tool and, and that tool to benefit the uh, open source community. And we're, we're very lucky at OWASP to, uh, because you chose us to release this to the world. Um, so there, yeah, there's already a lot of interest in Chainbench. So the question that's popular is, um, is Chainbench available already and how can I get it? Yeah, Mo, you can take this one. Okay, yeah, sure. So Chainbench is currently uh, still in uh, progress and we are uh, aimed to uh, release it in the next uh, two weeks. So we are officially going to release it uh, uh, in two weeks at uh, Open Source Summit at uh, Austin. Yeah, so June, June 20th, um, I think it's like the first day or right up before the first day of the Open Source Summit. Uh, which seems like a proper place to do it. So in two weeks' time is the official launch date. Uh, you can definitely follow. And uh, once the GitHub repository will, will be open to public, then uh, start it and, uh, and join the, the community of it. Very well, nice. Um, so just, I think, a couple more questions that I was wondering around Chainbench itself, right? And um, there's also the Open SSF Project Scorecard. How does that... Uh, compared to chain bench. Okay, so I will take that. Um, so first, it's uh, worth to mention the scorecard is an amazing project led by uh, Open uh, Source Security Foundation that has more than just one uh, cool project. 
I do see similarity uh, between uh, both of them. Uh, after all, they are both in the same area. Um, the main difference between them is what uh, is that uh, while scorecard aim to protect open source project, which may, uh, which uh, means it focused on uh, GitHub and on the left side of the software supply chain, uh, for example, card and build. Uh, Chainbench is aimed to protect every project, either it, uh, commercial or open source, from the code to deploy. Uh, and in addition, Chainbench uh, content is uh, led by a CIS benchmark. Thank you, more. Yeah. Um, and and Elam, maybe you can help us understand um, CIS benchmark. There's other things like NIST. How, how are they related or different? Yes, definitely. Um, so there are a lot of uh, different frameworks uh, by a lot of uh, organizations. Um, so for example, NIST, CIS that we've spoke, uh, talked about. Um, so there are similarities uh, and a lot of the time the organization even work together. So referencing one another. Uh, so that's nice. That's like the power of the community. Um, the agenda of everybody is to help secure the process. However, everybody got, every organization has their own angle. So. Uh, CIS, for example, is much more uh, specific uh, with the instructions. So it's literally a checks of do's and don'ts uh, on how to secure your software supply chain. Uh, what we liked in CIS is that once we read the instruction uh, as an engineer, uh, I can follow it. Um, and this is why Chainbench was built around uh, the compliance framework uh, with CIS. Um, so that's it, the, the specificity of, of the checks themselves uh, is what differentiates it from the the other frameworks. Oh, thank you. Yeah, and also congratulations on contributing to CIS uh, body of knowledge. Okay, let's move on to one more audience question. Uh, this is from Jose. Uh, how do you provide evidence that your actions are effective? That's the first part. And the second part is how to automatically track progress as soon as compliance department requires that. Okay, maybe I can take this one. So um, I hope I understand the question uh, as, uh, as it was uh, put. Um, so the, uh, the framework itself, what it does, that uh, Chainbench as a project, what it does is help you be compliant with the framework. Uh, the framework is CIS, CIS Software Supply Chain Security Benchmark. Um, this is the frameworks to be compliant with. Um, what we do is we run through the checks uh, and we help you kind of automatically uh, see if you are good or not so good uh, across the software supply chain. Um, so from left to right, uh, a bunch of checks uh, spread across the process. Um, if you get the red indication, then uh, you are possibly in a risk of a software supply chain attack. And then as Mo showed earlier, uh, you get the explanation, um, the specific link to AVD to see more information and even recommendations on how to remediate the process. Um, if you do a good job and you fix some of those red checks that fail, uh, then they would turn green. Um, and then you would know that you are more secure. One check is a little more secure, uh, other checks could be a lot more secure. Some of them are more weighted than others. Um, and then you would have the challenge of running it uh, as, as the question put it, um, running it like periodically um, to know that I continue to be to be compliance with the framework. Um, so that's definitely something that we recommend doing. Uh, so Chainbench is scoped to a single repository. Uh, so you use it on your GitHub organization and a repository of your choice. Uh, and you can do it multiple times. So you can run it again and again. Uh, you can do some automation around it, um, like schedule checks uh, to know that you're always compliant with. Um, or you can use off the shelf product Obviously, a lot of the work that we do here in Aqua uh, is automating Chainbench to give it to you um, just kind of as a, as a turnkey solution. Thank you, Elam. All right. Um, I think we have answered the audience questions. Yep. I think overall, uh, this was very good. We saw multiple demos and, and the great contributions that your team is making to open source and helping us uh, reduce our security risks. Uh, thank you, Elam, and more. And uh, good luck with uh, the next conference and the launch of CodeBench. Thanks for having us. Thank you very much.
nutzen.